Well, the most, the most exciting news of the year and of the decades for me in the world of ocean restoration, which has been attacked as a hugely controversial topic for decades, is the new law passed in the European Union in July of this year, 2023, the EU passed the Nature Restoration Law. And the Nature Restoration Law calls for the, for the European Union to using nature-based methods to restore its natural ecosystems, its seas and trees. <clears throat> and it's to begin immediately. And it wants to substantially accomplish that job by 2030. Everybody and welcome back to another climate emergency forum. My name is Charles, and I'm very delighted to be here with Russ George and Alex Carlin. And today we're going to talk about ocean restoration update 2023. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Alex because Alex is a reporter himself and he's going to ask Russ some questions about ocean restoration or ocean pasture restoration as well. So Alex, here you go. Excellent. Thanks so much, Charles. I love all your climate emergency videos, by the way. Um, and I am just so um, delighted to introduce Russ George. Um, somebody I met in 2017 at one of these um, United Nations climate conferences and as a reporter I was indicated to I should interview Russ because he's the leading expert on, on restoring the climate and uh, if I just wanted as a way of explaining how impressed I was I interviewed him for four hours and I was gonna stay for longer but I had another meeting because he was that informative so that's why he's here today because he's going to inform your audience. So my first question is simply, Russ, give an overview of uh, ocean restoration and why that's a solution that we should have as a priority. I've been working on you know, eco-restoration projects around the world for my whole life. And, uh, and when climate change became a, a big issue, which it, it sort of leapt into the world in the late 1980s, there was a very famous ocean scientist who had been spent her lifetime studying ocean plankton blooms, right? Which I, I call plankton blooms in the ocean. I call them ocean pastures because plankton growing in the ocean is the, is the equivalent of grass growing on land. And grass on land grows in pastures and plankton in the ocean grows in pastures. They happen to be ocean pastures. And John Martin pointed out that the oceans were dying <coughs> and the plankton was dying for want of a little bit of dust and that the amount of dust that was needed mineral dust to get the oceans back on track growing healthy again was a tiny amount right and that that would solve and that the oceans because they cover 71 percent of this planet and the phytoplankton performs 90% of the photosynthesis on this planet, that's what controls climate change. That's what controls CO2 and that's what controls climate change. So that's, that's how I got started. Right. When you say 90% of photosynthesis is generated by underwater life, plankton, this is an incredibly significant point because when you're talking about the climate issue, which is why we're all here in Dubai, the, qu the point you would think everybody would clearly understand is, oh, we have a problem of CO2 greenhouse effect. Well, what would solve that? I suppose it would be quite logical to say, let's remove some of that CO2 that's currently cooking us. And what you're saying is that the phytoplankton with photosynthesis has the capacity to do that. Can you talk a little bit more about that exact mechanism of photoplankton, 
photosynthesis and pulling out CO2? Well, you know, phytoplankton is just a plant. It's, a, it's, it's like the leaf of a tree. You know, in the ocean, the plants, the plankton in the ocean doesn't need, you know, tree trunks and limbs and branches and twigs to support the leaves. The leaves are just drifting in the ocean, right? So it's, it's an easy place it's to live if you're a plant. And there's, since there's 71% of the world is ocean, at least 29% of the world, that's land. But fully half of the land on the planet Earth is ice or rock, and it doesn't support life. So really when you get down to, and, and everybody understands that trees on land can take up carbon dioxide and store it as a, as a tree, as the living tree. And there's no, there's no dispute about that. But the ocean is, is full of plants that are the equivalent of trees. And they occupy 71% of the planet, not 11%, which is what forests occupy, right? Or, or vegetation occupies. So that's why you can, you know, we should look to the ocean, you know, as the, as the part of this world that manages our climate, manages our CO2. Okay, well, so then the point becomes this. People say, okay, if we're going to remove CO2, let's plant a tree. And you're, you're talking about the ocean-based photosynthesis as having certain advantages over that. I might ask you the time frame. How mu what's the time frame for planting trees to remove CO2? And what's the time frame for the ocean restoration doing it? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I know a lot about trees. I, I founded the second largest tree planting company in Canada in 1972. And that company has gone on to plant probably a half a billion trees across Canada. So it's hard work to plant trees, <laughs> right? Really hard work. And trees don't survive well even once you plant them, right? You, lo you lose most of the trees that you plant, you know? So th that's a hard game. And there's very limited amount of land where we can plant another tree on this planet. So, you know, where can we improve the condition of health on this planet, plant life, and that's in the ocean. This guy, John Martin, from uh, Moss Landing Marine Laboratory in 1989 had worked out the mathematics of, of why plankton grow or don't grow in the ocean. And he had shown that he, he knew that plankton was declining in the ocean. And he said the reason why plankton's declining is because it's not getting enough mineral dust, right? And uh, there was a mystery. Why is plankton not getting, why is the ocean not getting enough dust landing in the wind? And well, the, the, the answer to that is that high CO2 from human industry, anthropogenic CO2, makes plants grow better on land. So it makes the grass grow on land. And we all, and everybody knows that when you have lots of grass growing on the landscape, more grass growing means less dust blows in the wind. We don't have wind erosion. So it's that more grass growing, less dust blowing problem that John Martin pointed out was killing plant life in the ocean. And since plant life in the ocean controls CO2, which, and the rise of CO2 makes the planet warmer, creates global warming. You know, John Martin did the math. He said, all you need is to take some dust back to the ocean. So this is the very dust, right? Red, iron-rich dust, which has gone missing from the ocean, right? And so if you, and John Martin said, well, how much of this iron-rich dust does the planet need to restore the ocean to its maximum historic level of health and abundance? And what impact would that have on carbon dioxide? Well, he showed in his science that when dust had been plentiful over many geologic cycles in the Earth's history, dust in the wind put the planet into ice ages. So he said, the amount of dust we need, this material, is a half a shipload. So he said, give me a half a shipload of dust. I'll give you another ice age, right? And so he said, a half a shipload. Well, what's a half a shipload of this red dust? Well, this is red iron ore, hematite dust. And the world today <coughs> buys 
25,000 shiploads of this dust every year to make steel. And John Martin pointed out that only one half of one of those shiploads each year would, be, would suffice to restore the ocean to health, such a state of health, its historic level of health and abundance, that, it would, that the phytoplankton of the ocean would capture the CO2 and manage the entire global warming crisis of the planet. Well, that's fantastic. And I want to bring up something that is complementary to that, which is when you talk about global warming, you mentioned that, and the problem of the temperature of the planet going up, there's another climate-related um, crisis that we're in that's not about heating and not about temperature, and that's the acidification of the ocean. The fact that ocean life is dying from too much acid. And I want you to talk about what does plankton do when you restore the health and abundance of the plankton in the ocean? How does that affect the acid and acidity of the ocean and the killing of the life? Well, it's, it's, part, of, it's part of the phytoplankton's job. When phytoplankton captures CO2 in order to perform photosynthesis to grow itself, right? That's it, phytoplankton living in water captures the CO2 out of the water. But CO2 doesn't sit in water for long as CO2 because water is H2O, CO2 is CO2. So H2O plus CO2 gives you H2CO3, <coughs> which is carbonic acid, which is great if you like soft drinks, right? That's what gives the tart flavor to our soda water, right? Our, our fizzy water. And so plankton, when they're growing, you know, so if without plankton, the CO2 that enters the ocean all becomes carbonic acid, acidification. And there's the only solution you know, to possibly treat that would be to put one unit of ground up limestone for every unit of CO2 that goes into the ocean, which is an impossible solution, right? But phytoplankton take up CO2 at incredibly efficient rates. So phytoplankton prevent the CO2 from bonding to water and becoming acid. So it's a simple solution. So when the phytoplankton's growing, they are the natural buffering agent that keeps the ocean at the proper pH, right? And so that's the, so growing the phytoplankton saves the world from ocean acidification in me instantaneously, right? And it's, it's more severe and more dire than most people realize that if we don't do this solution to the acidification, we could lose virtually all ocean life in several decades, 20, 30, 40 years. Some scientists are saying we would lose all the fish and all the life in the ocean. So this is a serious problem and a serious solution. And the third thing I want to bring up is um, they call it albedo in scientific language, which is when the sunlight hits the planet, if it hits a white surface, it'll bounce back into space, and that's cool. That's a cooling effect. That's what the Arctic ice and Antarctic ice does a good job of up until today. So the question of albedo, how does plankton figure into that? And it's a leading question because I know plankton does something about creating albedo. Can you talk about that? Well, there was, there was a great scientific paper that came out 10 or 15 years ago. And it talked about how clouds need a little something to capture the moisture. It's called a nucleation seed that sits at the heart of a drop little uh, water condensation, condensation nuclei. nuclei, right? right on. And so the scientific paper came out and it said, and the, the tagline was, at the, in, the heart, at the, in the heart of every raindrop is a tiny speck of plankton, right? So since clouds all come from water and water on this earth is primarily in the ocean <clears throat> and plankton live in 71% of the planet, that's the ocean. That's where the vast majority of the of the condensation nuclei come from. So plankton are a plant. And so if you've ever walked into a forest or walked into a rose garden and you've smelled the plant life there, you're smelling tiny biomolecules, organic molecules 
that plants constantly emit. And those are the molecules, those are the tiny specks that form the heart of every raindrop. And plankton by far form the vast majority of these on the planet. So when you have abundant plankton, you have abundant clouds. But today, the scientific community knows that plankton have been in decline. And we've known it for a long time, back in the late 1960s and late 1970s, <clears throat> we saw the cataclysmic decline of plankton in the world's oceans. And it was such a crisis that the world scientific community said, how do we study plankton in the ocean? So they designed and built and launched the first ocean plankton satellite. And that, that satellite went into orbit in 1978, right? And its, so, its job was to quantitatively measure the decline of plankton. Well, today, from that satellite and, and many others of its kind that have been in orbit, we know that we've lost between 50 and 90 percent of the world's plankton. So between 50 and 90 percent of the world's cloud producing capacity has disappeared. And so when the plankton come back, <coughs> they bring back the clouds. And the clouds bring back, the clouds are, you know, you look up at a cloud and it's gray on the bottom. But if you look down from a airplane when you're flying, you know it's bright white on the top. <laughs> so all of these clouds are reflecting sunlight back into space and cooling the planet. So plankton are the most powerful cooling agent for the planet. And it doesn't take a long time to do that. And when clouds form, they, the clouds are there. They, they aren't there one day. They are there the next day. And they are reflecting. They're cooling the planet right, as soon as the cloud forms. So, so plankton sort of the savior, you know, many ways of this. Right, and that we're on a time-sensitive um, schedule here of uh, trying to solve these problems before it gets too hot to go out and work, too hot for farms to produce some food, and too acidic for life in the ocean. So we're, we're talking about things that need to have swift and uh, quick action. So I'm going to ask you just to re um, to make it really crystal clear for the viewers here when we're talking about ocean restoration how many years does it take to see a significant reduction in the greenhouse effect well it's 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 very immediate you know the reason you know the, the reason why we have this phrase called plankton blooms right is to describe this sudden blooming <coughs> that takes place when plankton blooms when plankton grows <clears throat> so plankton can go uh, the ocean can go from a, a clear blue lifeless ocean into a rich green ocean overnight when the right conditions arise okay I want to continue on the um, aspects of ocean restoration and what the effects are that are very important and and you might have re read stories about it's too hot to swim off of Miami like pregnant mothers better not swim because it's over a hundred degrees on the surface or something so I've um, I'd like you to address that what is what does plankton and ocean restoration do for cooling the surface of the ocean well it makes clouds right so just like if you're in Miami and you're on the beach and, you, and it's the hot sunny afternoon if you have a beach umbrella and you're in the shade of the umbrella it's cool enough to sit there comfortably whereas if you're out in the sun you're going to get overheated and sunburned promptly so plankton make clouds it's like making beach umbrellas because i heard that there's an, an additional um benefit with this with a plankton was they every day a 24-hour period they go down to the deep cold depths of the ocean and with their trillions of fins churn up that cold water and cool the surface is that a fact one of the other ways that plankton dynamically cools the ocean is that there is this this enormous population of little plankton animals zooplankton that live in the deep ocean and during the daytime they're down 300, 400 feet down in the ocean, where right on what's called the deep thermocline, where the temperature of the ocean is very cold. So even in the hottest tropical places in the world, 
the deep the temperature at the deep thermocline is is you know just above freezing right <clears throat> and so when those little animals are there in that cold pool of water resting during the daytime and eating what they ate last night they get cold and there are trillions upon trillions of them and every evening they swim to the surface to graze once again on the phytoplankton well each little copepod which is the half the size of a grain of rice is like a tiny ice cube and it, when, when it swims up to the surface of the ocean it brings its cold icy body up to the surface of the ocean and they are in such enormous numbers that this is actually a physical cooling heat pump so you know if you have hot water and you dump ice cubes into it the hot water becomes cooled well hot water on the surface of the ocean with trillions of trillions of little tiny ice cubes zooplankton. swimming up to the surface yeah. zooplankton copepods zooplankton, yeah. suddenly cools off <coughs> right so this is this is an immediate effect that one sees in plankton blooms is and in fact the, the copepods when they swim to the surface they were first noted in this they, it's called the the largest migration on earth is the daily the nightly migration of copepods from the depths to the surface because every morning before the sun rises they swim back down right because they don't want to be up at the top of the ocean in the sunlight when things that are bigger than them can find them and eat them mm -hmm. <laughs> right so they swim to the depths right so now what, what we really need to um talk about i think we're here at cop 28 and so the focus of the media and the focus of the delegates is well where are we now and what's um what are we gonna ha what's actually gonna happen We've had so much talking, we've had so much verbiage, so much discussions. What is the action? So could you just describe a little bit? Now, I just want to mention myself, I just came from Africa and I saw indications that Africa is going to be the leader of the climate movement with ocean restoration and doing um, incredible things uh, with that in terms of not talking, but actually restoring the ocean of Africa. And I wonder if you could talk anything about the p which parts of this planet are going to be you know taking action and how fast well the most the most exciting news of the year and of the decades for me in the world of ocean restoration which has been attacked as a hugely controversial topic for decades is the new law passed in the european union in july of this year 2023 the EU passed the Nature Restoration Law. And the Nature Restoration Law calls for the, for the European Union to using nature-based methods to restore its natural ecosystems, its seas and trees. <clears throat> and it's to begin immediately. And it wants to substantially accomplish that job by 2030. And in order to do that, they appropriated 8.3 billion euros per year to get this work done, which is actually more than sufficient. If only 10% if only of that were put into ocean restoration, that's more than sufficient to restore the oceans of Europe to their historic natural state of health and abundance, right? And, and that will take place, you know, that restoration will be, a con can be effectively accomplished easily by 2030 probably well before that. I, I think it will only take three years in any given location to get the ocean back to health. Well, that's fantastic. And I think it's fair to say that every nation has a duty and a right to, um, to restore any part of the ocean around the globe. Switzerland, a landlocked country, could restore the ocean out in uh, the Pacific. Is that correct? Yeah, because most of the world's ocean is the what people know as the high seas it's beyond the coast the territorial waters of nations so the vast majority 90 percent of the world's ocean is in the high seas it's not within a territorial nation's boundary so that ocean isn't no man's land it actually is considered under international law ocean law as being the ocean commons 
So every nation on Earth owns the open ocean just as much as every other ocean. So even a landlocked country at, like Switzerland has the authority to, and in fact the responsibility and duty to help restore its oceans, right? Which is a vast area part of the planet. Right, and as we know, as a lot of people are aware that ocean restoration occurred about 10 years ago um, in the area off the coast of Alaska and British Columbia from an indigenous tribe wanting to bring back their salmon and if you could just mention what was the results of that ocean restoration project well yeah and in, in I, i've been working with the haida people on the islands of haida Gwaii and british columbia for many decades mostly prescribing forestry restoration projects and doing you know eco restoration help with the with the village <coughs> and um, they came to me in 2007 and said well, we're the people of the salmon, and we no longer have enough salmon for, to feed our village that are coming back, so can't we restore the ocean? And they knew I was working on this ocean restoration work. So we spent years, from 2007 to 2012, working with the, with the village and the provincial government and the federal government and the National Research Council of Canada and you know every branch and and they dragged us through the typical Canadian uh, bureaucratic morass of years of review. And from day one, we had to file, a, every, every 90 days, we had to file a report to the Minister of Northern and Indian Affairs telling them what we had done in the past 90 days and what we intended to do the next 90 days. So we were probably the most rigorously you know, managed project in the history of Canada. And we, and we raised the money, and the National Research Ca uh, Council of Canada put up to, agreed to pay half of the scientific costs, and, and uh, the federal government gave us a uh, R&D tax credits that were worth 40-plus percent of the money that would be put in. So, so with the village and I, we, we worked like crazy, and we eventually raised about two and a half million dollars in cash and almost the same and about the same amount of money in support funds from these federal agencies and organizations and the province of British Columbia loved the project because it had a carbon tax in the in the in at the time and and so they worked with us for two years to develop our blue carbon credit methodology that if we did the work it would prove we could we could demonstrate in good with good sound science how many carbon credits we would produce from the work and finally we went out to sea and when we went out to sea to do the work you know it just worked so myself I took my I, I went out with 10 members of the village and we mixed up 4,000 bags of uh, this r r red mineral dust made red muddy water on the boat went back and forth across a hundred by a hundred kilometer patch of ocean and changed the concentration of iron in the ocean according to John Martin's prescription from a part per trillion to maybe a hundred parts per trillion which is a, a, a million times below the concentration that fertilizers are are effective at and what happened overnight right in literally overnight the ocean turned from blue to green and since the company's name was called the Haida Salmon Restoration Company, which was a village-owned company, village form, village-owned company, you know, that was, that was our goal, to bring back the fish. So the plankton grew. We had state-of-the-art scientific equipment. You know, one division of Government of Canada gave us two quarter of a million dollar ocean, state-of-the-art ocean robots. We had the largest fleet of these ocean robots of any organization on Earth at the time. You know, the, the famous Scripps Institute or Woods Hole in the, in the USA only had one. We had two. You know, there was insane jealousy, professional jealousy from those institutions. You know, how, how dare a bunch of Indians from a remote, you know, from a village of 853 Haida people on the on a, on the on a island in the remote northern British Columbia Ocean how dare they 
you know, try to perform a state-of-the-art ocean restoration project with, along with the state-of-the-art state ocean science. And guess what? It just worked, right? So the ocean bloomed. It, the plank, the ocean that turned green, we could see it from the satellite fleet. Like the Canadian Space Agency came to us before we went out to sea, and they put on a special three-day seminar to teach our team, our company native team, how to access the international fleet of satellites <coughs> to measure the plankton from space. So, so once the ocean turned from blue to green, <coughs> we knew it was working. And because we were working in what I call a large ocean pasture, which is a large eddy that forms in the ocean, the swirling eddy mixed the patch of iron enriched water that we created from, that started as 10,000 square kilometers. That's what we treated. <coughs> but it grew to about between 30 and 50,000 square kilometers. <coughs> so that turns out to be the largest eco-restoration project in the history of the world, run by a village of 853 people and one old guy. <laughs> and so, you know, did it work? Well, it did, and, and the scientific data we were collecting showed that, that we were pulling hundreds of thousands, sorry, hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 was being pulled out of the atmosphere, <coughs> being turned into the plankton. So much so that the CO2 sensors that we had on the ship <coughs> that were constantly sampling the CO2 concentration in the air, when we sailed outside of the bloom, the plank, the pasture, we would see the normal earthly CO2 levels, right? The baseline. As soon as we would sail into the pasture, the, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere would plunge down because the plankton were literally sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere faster than the air could replenish it over this 50,000 square kilometer patch of ocean, <coughs> right? So, Hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 were pulled out of the atmosphere. But the goal was to grow the, bring back the fish. So, you know, the fish were, that we were targeting were the pink salmon, which are the smallest and shortest life cycle of the five Pacific salmon species. They only have a two-year life cycle. So we knew that the pink salmon <coughs> that go out to sea every spring usually mostly starve to death. So, so getting, getting to the story of what were the results in terms of the fish. So pink salmon were the perfect species for us to choose. And we chose a pasture that's close to Haida Gwaii, which is known as the Haida Eddy. It's legendary in the world of OSHA science. <coughs> and we knew that, that we suspected that the Haida Eddy is the nursery pasture for the pink salmon. So we, so we assumed that if we could restore the nursery pasture of the pink salmon, the baby pink salmon that swam out to sea, instead of mostly starving, would be treated to a feast. And so when would we see the result? Well, we wouldn't see the result for another year when the pink salmon swam back to their rivers and streams <coughs> to renew their life cycle by spawning. So the very next year, we were waiting eagerly to see what the returns are. In Alaska, which is the, has the largest catch of pink salmon in the North Pacific, they were expecting to have an extraordinarily good pink salmon catch that year of 50 million fish. And their forecast is never off by more than 5%. <coughs> right? but in, and so they started fishing pink salmon in Alaska the very next year. And instead of catching 50 million fish, they stopped catching pink salmon after catching 225 million fish, which is the largest catch of pink salmon in all of history. And they only stopped catching at 225 million because there was no longer any place on shore that could receive another fish. Every fish processing plant, every fish buyer was overstocked with salmon. We kept, we kept getting reports from native villages up and down the coast that every little stream, no matter how small it was, was jammed with pink salmon. 
that year. So we think we actually brought back 500 million additional fish. <laughs> so it was the greatest pink salmon miracle in all of history. So now I just want to uh, bring up being here at COP28 in Dubai, um, that overall, I th think it's fair to say that the delegates here and the leadership and the people at home reading have this sort of uh, general understanding they believe in what has become a mantra for the subject of climate, which is the solution is reducing emissions and phasing out fossil fuel. And you know, this is we're, we've been talking about something different. We've been talking about removing CO2 directly from the amount of CO2 that's currently cooking us and causing all these problems. As it's clear that emissions reduction and phasing out fossil fuels is t talking about a different subject, really. It's talking about future additions to the problem. So the real, so one of the most important questions I'm going to ask you about that is a, a key point, which is if by some miracle there was an accomplishment of reducing emissions and phasing out fossil fuels, let's say with a magic wand, let's say we had a magic wand and we ended all oil companies, all cars, and all emissions, the current amount of CO2 that is now today causing all these terrible problems, this lethal dose of CO2, how long would that, how long would it take for that CO2 to go away by itself which is important for the question of emissions reduction and phasing out fossil fuel. Because if you're talking about, if you're saying that the solution to the problem is reducing emissions and phasing out fossil fuel, you're implying very strongly that, yeah, if we can just reduce emissions and phase out fossil fuel, we'll be okay because the CO2 that's currently above our heads is going to go away by itself and we'll have solved the problem. Now tell me what the real uh, answer is to that question. How long does it take for that CO2 to go away by itself? So, so the question is, you know, what happens if we stop using fossil fuels immediately, right, today or tomorrow? Which nobody believes can really happen, right? It will take decades to end the use of fossil fuels. But even if we miraculously stop tomorrow, well, the British Royal Society did a massive paper study of this 15 years ago. <coughs> and in that Royal, which is still the benchmark, gold standard, you know, research project on the subject of, you know, the, the lifespan of CO2 in the atmosphere, of legacy CO2 in the atmosphere. So we have, we have a whole fossil fuel age of yesterday's CO2 going into the air. And, and that's something between one and two trillion tons of CO2 that was emitted in all of the yesterdays. Well, the Royal Society said, okay, how long will it take for that to, for, the, for nature to, to re-equilibrate, <coughs> right, to adjust and remove the legacy CO2 from the atmosphere so that global warming stops, right, and we can have, and we can begin to cool. Well, they said, yeah, it's an easy number, right? It's somewhere between 2 and 20 centuries, right? So if we stop fossil fuel burning <coughs> today, which many people here are de at this COP28 are demanding be the only agenda item, <coughs> we'll, see, we'll see the results. Best case scenario, we'll begin to see an, a result in 200 years. <clears throat> more likely it will take 2,000 years before climate change changes back, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so so the, the, the issue I have with stop fossil fuels is that it's an enormous distraction from what is the most urgent crisis today on the planet, right? The most, this is classic medical triage, you know, emergency medicine. Right? We have, a, we have a, a victim who's been poisoned, right? She's been given a lethal overdose of a deadly poison. That's CO2, right? That CO, the, the victim's name is Mother Earth and her sister Mother Ocean, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so what do we do to save them? Well, well if, we, if we say, don't bother saving them right now, keep them from taking a second lethal dose. 
right? Don't give them a second lethal dose of CO2. Stop fossil fuel because tomorrow's fossil fuel will give them a second lethal dose of poison. It does no good whatsoever, right? Because the, the two most adorable victims, Mother Earth and Mother Ocean, die from the first lethal dose. So the only real solution that anybody should be focusing on is saving the Earth, all right? And saving the ocean. Well, John Martin pointed out the way. And, and we built satellites and put the first satellite working on this in 1978. And a, a dozen additional satellites have been put in orbit. There's another super satellite going up in a few weeks time called PACE. <clears throat> That's gonna add to this. We have spent billions of dollars and 50 years researching the phytoplankton of the ocean and how we can take care, how we can restore them to their historical level of health and abundance and make them bloom again. And as John Martin pointed out, we, they, they have the capacity to immediately heal the planet, right? Of yesterday's poison. Now, we, we don't want to give it another dose. Second, <laughs> second we don't want to chase the, the healing therapy with a second lethal dose. But number one, give the healing therapy first, right? <laughs> you know, heal the patient first. We'll fi we can fight pump, over pump the- Pump their stomach. Yeah, pump their, pump their stomach. stomach, right? And you know, yeah. heal them, bring them back to life and, life and health. And, and then we can engage in the battle about stopping the second lethal dose. But, but to, you know, here, I, I, we run into problems where people say, no, don't allow ocean restoration to take place. So even though the European Union has now made it against the law to not engage in ocean restoration, <laughs> the U.S. National Academy of Science and the major U.S. scientific institutes in the United States have a statement out saying that their recommendation is that ocean restoration must not be allowed to proceed for at least 10 years. And that in any case, it, any, any level of work that goes on in the next 10 years, no private sector scientific, science work or technology work should be allowed. In fact, private sector science, ocean science must be outlawed. That's the policy of the U.S. National Academy of Science. Are they saying that in terms of because we, the academics, need another 10 years to make sure it's okay? Is that what they're saying? They're saying that because they insist that 50 years of academic research, institutional research, and billions of dollars poured into those academic institutional pockets isn't enough, right? Don't, the solution couldn't possibly be at hand. Those 50 years of work and billions of dollars isn't enough. So don't allow a solution to arrive. It's like the people, it's like when the, when the internet was invented, I'm old enough to, to know that before the internet was invented, I used to have to send my electronic mail using a telex machine, right? Which was a telegraph machine. And I had to pay per character. So I had to keep my messages short because it was very expensive. And when the internet arrived, there was a huge fight from the scientific community that had invented the internet to not allow the internet into the public, right? Because it would kill the telex industry and it would kill the fax machine industry, right? And so they said, don't allow, the, don't allow free electronic communication to occur. Don't solve the problem that electronic communication might help save the world. Don't, don't do that because it will limit money. You know, somebody won't be making as much money as they are today. Right, so, I mean, the point is that we're in a really serious, urgent, existential crisis, and the things you're just referring to are these sort of more, you know, mundane and provincial and uh, things that, that shouldn't carry the day. You know, what should carry the day are life or death issues being solved with real solutions in time. So, Mike, I just want to, again, ask you, um, you mentioned the EU. What other parts of the planet are you sensing are getting that 
er, that feel that um, momentum to actually do some real solutions here before it's too late. Well, every, everywhere in the world is moving on ocean restoration, or what I, I like to call ocean pasture restoration, because the it's good to restore coral reefs, right? Okay, it's good to you know grow some extra kelp or some seagrass on the shore, or plant some mangrove trees, but those are a, a you know one percent of the ocean solution. So as much as they're they're great to occur. <clears throat> like we should plant every tree we can in the world, but there's not enough room to plant enough trees to save the planet, right? So, but every tree saves a bird or a bug or a, or a creature, right? And, and helps. But the ocean is waiting, the ocean pastures, the phytoplankton blooms of the ocean and the productivity of the ocean has historically been there. You know, we know that the ocean is an ecosystem that responds in blooms, right? And so, you know, to bring the ocean blooms back, John Martin showed us, we only need, you know, one half of one of the 25,000 shiploads of iron dust that the world consumes to make steel. And that's enough to take care of the planet. So I don't even know what fraction of a percent is one half of one over 25,000, it's, it's an infinitesimal tax on humanity, right? So we have viewers here, we have the people watching this video, I'm sure some of them are asking, uh, would ask you, well, what can I do to make this happen faster and more uh, strongly? Well, it, it's, it, you know, the, fortunately this, this uh, the oceans don't need a lot of our help, right? You know, my, my village of, uh, <coughs> the Haida village I worked with, you know, my village of Old Masset in British Columbia, I mean, we removed uh, a quarter of Canada's entire carbon footprint, you know, a village of 853 people. So, so the world does not need to be saved by the biggest nations and organizations amongst us. You know, it would only take about 100 small of the smallest amongst us, 100 villages who get to work to to take care of their ocean pasture that's adjacent to their village. That will be sufficient to save the entire planet for the, all of the rest of us. Right. So so if I'm a, sitting in Chicago, I might consider going to a fishing village in uh French West Africa and and starting a little business there of uh, um, restoring the ocean off in the Gulf of Guinea is that the kind of thing you're you're referring to or how would somebody watching this video feel like they could really contribute to this you know this doesn't work at near the shore it only works hundreds of miles out to sea, high seas. yeah on the high seas high, so that's an yeah that's an important so you can't really you know, as an individual, you really can't do it. It also, it also only works in a, at an ecological, you know, precise level. So not every speck of iron that lands in the ocean produces a sustainable, successful, blooming pasture, right? You know, some, it, all of it will produce some photosynthesis, but, a, but an ocean pasture is a self-sustaining ecosystem. So when the plankton grows at the surface, the first thing it does is it sends out a, a low frequency sound signal. And that sound signal is of such ultra low frequency that it travels thousands of miles across the ocean unattenuated. So everything in the ocean hears the dinner bell, which is a low frequency thump, thump, thump. It's Mother Ocean's heartbeat and they all and everything so in our Haida ocean pasture we had before the pasture bloomed we were looking for whales and seabirds and everything that we could see and we would count one or two whale spouts per day and we were covering hundreds of miles we were looking over thousands of square kilometers of ocean so the whales were very very rare right 
and the seabirds we would see little clumps of uh, seabirds you know two or three a few times a day dipping into the ocean <clears throat> but when the pasture bloomed and the pasture sent out its call that there was an abundance of food available the first thing that happens is the seabirds arrived so one morning I was on the boat and when the sea, and I and just as dawn was coming up you know I was I was on the, f the bow of the boat looking out over this dark empty ocean and suddenly I could and as the light began to happen in the sky I could hear birds in the sky and I said well there's a lot of birds in fact the bird sound became so loud I couldn't hear the engines on the boat anymore and as dawn rose the sky was dark with tens of thousands of seabirds who had who had flown in to swoop into into the ocean plankton bloom to feed and then the, the bloom continued and we had the great whales arrive so the blue whales arrived the fin whales arrived the say whales arrived all of the great whales arrived and we had so many whales that one day I put a observer on each quarter of the boat looking out at their quarter of the horizon and I said okay for one hour just make a tick mark on your pad when you see a whale spout right we couldn't keep up with the numbers of whales that had come to the bloom and and the, and the whales were not only did they come to the bloom they came to us so here we were a small ship in the middle of the bloom studying the bloom you know think they knew it was us because one morning we, the whales were there and the captain of the boat you know started dancing around and he was a naturalist and and he said Russ come here quick he says look at this coming up to the front of the boat here's here's three fin whales which are the the most the shyest of all whales in the ocean are the fin whales, whales too, yeah they're the second largest whale very yeah. shy yeah. and here's a, a mother fin whale with a newborn calf and another fin whale and they swam right up to the bow of the boat and the boat was stopped we were making water samples scientific samples at the time and he said well get a picture of them quick they won't be here long right well they stayed with us you know 20 feet from the boat for an hour right and kept sitting there and and looking us in the eye you know and then you know no one would ever have dreamed of making a friendlier eye contact with the beautiful woman in the bar as seeing those fin whales you know making you know this appreciative eye contact with us so the so the animals came all of ocean life came and the seabirds came and in addition to you know the fish coming back the very next year there was a wonderful story about whales so orca whales in the pacific northwest we know feed mostly on salmon so we started looking at what was happening with the orca whales. So at exactly one gestational cycle from the following year when the salmon came back, the reports throughout the Pacific Northwest was of the largest baby boom of baby orcas in history occurred, right? Because good maternal nutrition grows healthy babies, <laughs> right? Okay, so, you know, We've had a great chat with Russ and Alex here. And Russ, it's really great being able to interview you in person. I think what a difference it makes to meet the, the man in person. And great, Alex, too, having you here because you're so well versed on all of this. You're, you're a student of Russ and, and you've studied it yourself. So, you know, it's helpful to have somebody that can really ask the right questions so that's great so now as part of this program uh, because um, Alex is a musician and Alex maybe you want to just talk a little bit about your Africa tour activity yeah I just arrived here from French West Africa and it started a year ago exactly at COP 27 in Egypt um, when I was at the African Pavilion with some um, people I was meeting from just becoming friends with um, from Togo and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire and and Benin and I it just this songs just emerged from just improvisation but it was we were singing like Togo will be the leader Benin will be the leader and finally it became 
Africa will be the leader. And it just, it became, when I stopped singing it, the entire Togo Pavilion started singing it without me. So I realized I had a hit on my hands, like an anthem. Like, we are the world, we are the children. And I just realized, so at that moment, the lead delegate from Cote d'Ivoire had invited me to, to go to Cote d'Ivoire and talk about ocean restoration. But I, so what I did is I went there six months ago to meet him and, and talk with the people in, in, in the government there, but, all, but that was during the day, every day for a week. But every evening, I was in the reggae bars and I was meeting musicians and I, I, they threw me on a stage with the best reggae band I've ever seen. And I started singing that song that they'd never heard before and they played it perfectly without ever rehearsing it. And, I, and, and that just generated what happened in November, which was the November tour that I went back for which was called the Africa Will Be the Leader Africa Climate Ban Campaign. So we did four nations, the four nations I mentioned, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, and Benin, and French West Africa. We did a, four events where each event started with a press conference where we, we, we talked about ocean restoration and plankton power, but we also had indigenous people coming from the hinterlands of each nation coming down and we would just listen to what we didn't already know about what we should be doing while we're waiting for the plankton to repurpose the co2 you know the indigenous people have ideas of you know have knowledge about how we should be living better and not suffering so much and so we can be still alive by the time we solve climate problems right so that that was the press conference concept and then we would go into the concert so we would have local bands joining us and we would do a concert um, in these great venues so we did four events and we're doing another one on Friday here at COP28 we're doing an event at the Climate Live Pavilion at uh, B7 Building 90 and then we're gonna after this COP28 is over we're going to create that we are the world video the actual we're going to get just like in we are the world where they had cameo lines by bob dylan and michael jackson and bruce springs we're going to have african stars singing one line each and we're going to put together a video all kinds of exciting uh visuals jesse and david as well. and what jesse well jesse david yeah absolutely jesse david <laughs> jesse david's great and when we're going to um so we're going to put that video worldwide as a propeller to the 2024 Africa will be the leader um, tour. So we're gonna go to all the other African countries in 2024. You know, certainly Senegal, certainly Kenya, certainly South Africa, Ethiopia, places that um, um, really are already engaging with us. Because what we're saying is we're changing, well, we're changing the media narrative from Africa as a victim to Africa as the leader. Because we're, not, we're done waiting for, you know, USA, Europe, China, India to, we're, we're not waiting for, nobody can wait any longer. They've had 50 years and they're just going to be inspired by Africa's actions and they're going to join us. But the lead ha is coming from Africa, in my opinion, at least from what I've seen personally on the ground. And that's where I'm seeing the momentum, the excitement, the drive, the ability to, you know, have a rock and roll guy like me talk to somebody in the government, they listen and they say, would that happen in the USA or your, I don't know, maybe, but not likely. So it's like, I find that Africa is in the right place at the right time and they need it and they're facing no food, no farms, no fish, you know, they're facing that, you know, more than, the, so I, it, at this point, I want to, I want to, yeah, it's existential and I, and the song has been driving it. So I'd like to play you a little bit of that. to power local solutions you can join us yes of course you can africa will be the leader africa will be the leader africa will be the leader of the climate solution today there's a climate solution today and africa 
workers leading the way. Plankton power. Plankton blooms bring down the CO2. And they create white clouds which cool the planet too. And they stop ocean acidification. And this will be done from any African nation. Africa is leading. Africa is leading. of the plankton is the key which first is bringing back the fish and then the greenhouse gases become much less because of the rising photosynthesis Africa will be the leader Africa will be Ocean faster restoration, climate restoration today. Plankton power. <laughs>